welcome to the VMware Multi-Cloud Podcast. My name is Eric Nilsson, and with me I have my co-host David Josso. On the podcast today, we're going to be speaking with David Geringer from Dimensional Research. He will be covering interesting research on multi-cloud use maturity. Before we get to that, David, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. And um, before we get into David, let me just talk a little bit about what we've been doing around multi-cloud maturity. We um, We've been doing a lot of different things around it. We, you know, we recently published an ebook on it, sort of a framework for multi-cloud maturity that looks at eight major capabilities. I won't get into them now, but you can find that if you search for VMware multi-cloud maturity, I'm sure you'll find it. And we also did a bit, we're doing a video program on it. And as part of that, we uh, did doing some market research around, you know, what, what the state of the market is. And that's where uh, David fits in. Um, so David, hey, how, uh, maybe can you introduce yourself, uh, give us a little background on the study, and then we'll jump into some of the findings. Sure, sure. So I'm a principal here at Dimensional Research, been here a little over 10 years, um, which, you know, gives us a lot of insight. I've been doing a lot of projects with David over the years, so a lot of broad coverage. Um, Dimensional primarily focuses on the tech industry. So we do cover subjects from cloud to security to, uh, you know, I am to, you know, uh, all the things that are there. Um, probably the other interesting thing is I spent most of my career before this uh, on the other side of the fence, uh, running product teams and marketing teams at startups and some large enterprise software companies. So we always approach the, re the research, not just from what's the data, but what does it mean to the business? And, what can we what can we actually walk away what's usable what's actionable so that's a little about us and dimension yeah a great thing about david also just for the folks that you know may not know him is that um, he's working with a lot of tech companies so he sees a lot of things out there in terms of where uh, where the customers are and what they're doing and so it's uh, it's always great to work with david on these projects for this project that i worked with david on we did a, a qualitative and a quantitative approach and for those of you that don't you know, dive into the research terms all the time. We did a, a large international survey and we coupled that with some in-depth interviews. And the, the survey kind of gives you the numbers and then the interviews kind of give you the context and a little spice and a little things behind it. So a little about the survey, over a thousand individuals um, that are manager directors or VPs at companies that have direct responsibility for public cloud and application development. So those that are really familiar with using the hybrid cloud and what goes in it and how they op and how you develop for them. And um, most and all the people that participated were from enterprise companies with a thousand or more employees with a global distribution, about half of them from North America, about a quarter from Europe and uh, the remaining 20 odd percent from the rest of the world. Um, all industries were invited to participate. So it's a great cross section of the marketplace and what's going on globally. The other, yep. the other side, no, was the uh, was the interviews? We did twenty in depth interviews, and almost all of those were, were very senior people, VP, CIOs, and all of those people gave us great insight to what's going on with their company and how multi cloud and adoption and all of these things are actually functioning in their company. It gave us some opportunity to ask some why questions to some of the survey findings. So, very good rounded three hundred sixty view of you know kind of the hybrid cloud, the market, and the maturity and why. Cool. Hey, um, we're going to jump in in a second. Um, you know, maybe we, you know, sort of, um, you know, back up and start with sort of the highest level of kind of view first, and then we'll get into some of the deeper findings. But you know, one of the things we were interested in finding is like, hey, you take a typical public cloud um, portfolio from any company. What does it look like? So maybe we can talk about some of the findings. Like, you know, sort of think of, you know, things either got to the cloud because they were migrated and then they were just run as is, or they were refactored, or they were built there. So we were very interested in finding out what does the typical portfolio on a cloud look like? Where did it come from? So maybe you can talk about what we found there, David. Sure, sure. It, it, it is a bit interesting. It's almost broken into equal parts, into you know a third, a third, a third, if you will, a few percentage points off here and there. But I think from the, from the big walk away is, you know, about a third, a third of the apps in there were migrated, kind of lift and shift. Um, and a little story, we found out why and what, what's driving that. So for a lot of companies are starting on their cloud journey, the lift and shift was the early way to figure it out. Hey, does this gonna work? Do minimal effort? What do I have to learn? So we, so we do see a lot of things that were lifted and shifted for that. Um, another reason that things are kind of just lifted and shifted or just migrated straight over has to do with development cycles. And sometimes IT and the development cycles aren't always paired. 
So sometimes IT finds it beneficial for an economic or operational reason to move it, but they haven't gone through and refactored it because it hasn't hit um, kind of a product roadmap driven reason. So with the next feature, the next update, the next sets of services they need, they plan to do that. So they're, they're going to do, you know, they'll go through and refactor it when the product demands it versus just the platform. Yeah. When you go and look at the ones that were migrated, which is another 30, 30% um, that were migrated and then, um, you know, updated or modernized, a couple of drivers there. One is almost the inverse of what we saw. Companies said, hey, if I'm going to take the effort to move something to the cloud, might as well do it right. One, one and done was a quote somebody said. So they'll modernize it uh, on the way. And then we have about 33%, you know, are the people that are built in the cloud. And when we asked them why build in the cloud versus the other options, it really came to an effort. I think they were very pragmatic and they said, look, if we have an app or something that's existing, it's just too much work to get it to modernize or run in the cloud. That's when we cut bait, just build something new. And that was kind of the big driver for that third. Yeah, cool. Hey, uh, one of the things we looked at also, and it's part of the competency model, the, the uh, maturity framework, if you will, is this whole idea of getting value beyond IaaS, right? I mean, it's like, you know, I think an early driver for the cloud was pure IaaS, right? But then to have just a plethora of cloud services, right? You know, PaaS type, you know, PaaS and, um, and above, basically. Um, you know, so we were looking at, well, how many people are really taking advantage of that? So maybe you can talk about what we found there. Yeah, so kind of kind of a surprising finding. You know, when we looked at it, of 96% of all the people we surveyed are using a cloud service today. So that's almost every single company that's, you know, in the, in the IS environment is using some sort of a, you know, cloud service today. Um, when we kind of look at what they are and kind of break them into more consumable terms of, you know, what's the frequency and the you know, type of maturity of use, about half of all the companies um, said that a quarter of their applications are using kind of mature um, types of cloud services. And if you look at a little, just a little bit less, just a third of the companies said about half of their apps are leveraging more than one cloud service. Mm -hmm. And when we look at some of the cloud services that really top the list, the top two or three that are just under, you know, 50% of people using them was, you know, IOT, uh, CI, CD services, and, you know, um, I integrated development environments, IDEs. Just behind that, we do see some of the AI, DAS types of solutions and containers. And we'll get to the containers a little bit later. Um, little comments, we'll, we'll get to this later about how these services can be sticky. And that's something that's really, you know, fixing in the mind of these companies as they look at their cloud maturity journey. Great. Hey, um, that's great. Uh, that, that, so that was like, we've covered a couple different things that were part of the maturity model, which is like having the ability to have um, sort of be ambidextrous on getting to the cloud and getting apps on the cloud. And then also taking advantage of uh, higher level services, right? Because otherwise you're building a lot of stuff that today you don't have to because there's somebody else is building it and taking care of it. And it's not core. So why, why go ahead and do that? Uh, really a big area of interest for us was this whole idea of where people are with, you know, we called it DevOps just to keep it simple, but it's it's talking about app dev broadly, right? So it's like, you know, whether you're using Agile and if you've adopted some of the core DevOps best practices and um, also microservice frameworks and things like that. What, what uh, maybe give some thoughts on sort of what we found in, in, in the data. Right. So. The, the short answer, and was, was I would say was initially a little surprising, is we found just about 51% of companies are doing DevOps, CI, CD, um, using containers and doing those types of things. And it trails off a little bit when you start talking about site reliability, site reliability engineering, which is just around over a third. And then, you know, microservices is, is pretty close to 40%. And the reason I say it's a little surprising, I think we all intuitively feel like more people are doing agile, CI, CD, DevOps. And I would say this is where the one interesting thing with the, the interviews really filled in the color. Um, we tend to think, and we tend to hear about a lot of people in technology, fin services, and even healthcare, which are actually really advanced IT shops. But we had an, an interview from one guy from an insurance company, and he just went on at how hard it is that they try to do DevOps and their developers have a bunch of mainframe experience and they kind of revolted and pushed off, pushed it off. So the company had to go and hire people right out of college, create their own little unit that's DevOps. It's away from everybody else to not be 
um, you know, kind of squashed. And now they're doing some DevOps. And so I guess the long answer is, is 50% may sound a little bit low, but there are a lot of industries when you think about oil and gas or you think about, you know, nonprofits and stuff that some of these more advanced techniques either haven't made their way in or the software development aren't just a, such a huge driver for their company historically. And that kind of gives a little visibility to why I think some companies, 80 or 90 percent of uh, their development is done on DevOps, and we have that from other research. So we know the shops that have developed it are aggressive and moving to an 80, 90, 100% adoption rate. But there are a lot of companies that are still early days in that adoption path. Yeah. Hey, David, I got a, a good, yeah, follow-up go question, good follow-up question on that. Um, to David G, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is there there is this cultural adoption that has to happen when you're talking about DevOps and you're talking about, I have younger kids that come out of computer science. And some of these guys now, the it's not just DevOps, it's they're actually on call to do support of the software because they're just in time. There isn't quite as rigorous of a test and release cycle. And so the whole thing is built to actually do fixes in real time in production. Um, and so there, it seems like I look at this and I go, man, if I were in my 20s, I guess I would do that because I would be used to coming out of college and doing that. But I, I grew up in software development where we were doing long cycles and packages. And so when we were done with testing, I didn't have to sit and do on-call support in production. That was for the for production people. But now I see the next generation, a lot of the 20-year-olds that I work with, they're actually, as part of that cycle, doing mm -hmm. the, 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 the support cycles. Oh, I'm on call this month. Or they'll cycle through all the people on the team where they'll actually have real support cycles in production throughout the weekend, you know, throughout holidays, whatever. I guess there is this, I'm starting to understand that just how you mentioned that sometimes culturally you just have to spin up a different unit because you're, you, the, the current guys aren't going to do that. Um, is there like an adoption strategy that people are, I, I guess there is the make small teams, but is there, are you seeing, you know, companies dealing with it differently or, or you know, like, and segregating what they work on versus what they don't migrate to the cloud in that, in that space? Yeah. So I, I do think it, so, so the first thing is DevOps is like agile, which is almost like cloud, which there's a lot to it. And I would say, Fundamentally, what you're referring to is something that we've seen in all of the DevOps research we've done, that there's a cradle to grave model. And that's a really tight team and they own the app. They develop it, they code it, they test it, they put it in production, they answer their own support calls and they own it and they kind of operate almost autonomously. And it's usually aligned around a line of business application. And so I think when you, see companies that are rapidly adopting. I think what happens a lot of times is you start with something, then they see the benefits. And then the company, based on its culture and its politics, to be quite honest, kind of develop into two models. Either it becomes very pervasive and everybody gets into DevOps, or you start moving really high priority, fast moving, revenue tied applications into a DevOps package. Because you can make, um, we always think of things of adding features, and taking support calls is what DevOps. But a lot of people think about, how about your competitive responsiveness? How about your response to COVID? How about all these other types of supply chain? Like your traditional stuff fails in today's environment. And so we do see that um, that DevOps adoption in those kind of high opportunity, high revenue areas is where we see DevOps take hold. And then they become, you know, the light becomes bright, but it also becomes a good stage light. So I think that, first success, then they kind of get to work with the, with the with the great app, then other people come online. And that, that kind of creates the cultural shift um, because it does work and it's driving revenue. And that's where, you know, high priority focus is. Yeah, I, I have to um, say this was one of those areas that really surprised me as well. You know, you'd mentioned that when you saw this and, you know, I was involved in, um, you know, early versions of DevOps, um, Extreme programming. I worked with some teams back in the '90s, right when they came out of uh, Redmond, basically. And um, you know, I was like, "Wow, this, you know, this is going to take off," and 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 it has taken off. But the the you know, after I saw our data, I went and kind of did a survey of like everything else that's out there on DevOps, and it's, and it's all consistent. I mean, it's like it's not as far along as anybody thinks. And the same with Agile and um, you know, microservices and all these things that. Um, 
there are pockets in almost every company in some way, shape or form, but not always well known to the rest of the company. That's right. But it's it's still it's still not, uh, you know, anywhere near where I thought it was going to be, given that some of the stuff has been out for like 15, 20 years. Yeah. Um, I have one other quick question and then I'll let you go, David Jasso. Um, My follow-up question is uh, self-selection of survey results. Um, If you survey, how many are responding? You say the 50% rate uh, are moving to cloud and and have cloud in in their production environments. Um, How much of this is because uh, I care about it, I respond to the survey? Did you you make sure that you covered for non-response because they're just not interested in the topic at all? Well, I mean, to get into our surveys, they actually have to be qualified, right? So we Mm -hmm. ask a lot of qualification about demographic and other types of stuff. And usually, you know, if they're not qualified, they they get asked to move. I think something that probably may or may not be interesting, and one of the reasons we like working with VMware, and I think they like working with us, a lot of our participants come from uh, a dimensional research database. And so these people like to participate in research. We do interviews with them. We do focus groups. We just got done a big focus group. And a lot of the people will tell you that they like to take the surveys because it makes them think. They find it interesting and stimulating. Um, And so generally what happens is when we look at, you know, a survey, we do have a quality control group within our own stuff of people that we know are highly, you know, qualified in that area and look for, for deviations. But we also look for abandonment in surveys. It's a big thing of how we build our surveys to make sure the questions are clear and concise and can't be interpreted and we don't have abandonment. And so anytime we see more than four or 5% abandonment across the survey, we realize that there's a problem. And so this yeah. survey had a really tight two, two to 3% abandonment, um, which can be just, you know, somebody got a phone call or, you know, got disconnected or their boss walked in or whatever it goes on. So um, in general, having highly qualified um, participants makes the research. Otherwise, you're asking, you know, yeah. a baker what they think about sure. hybrid cloud. Right. And they're like, I don't know. Do you put salt yeah. in it? So, I, I yeah. know as an IT professional, I always hear survey, and that's immediately comes to my head. How much do I trust this? Do I believe this? You know, obviously VMware has a good brand. You guys are work with us for a long time, but I I do want to stress that you know for people that are listening to this podcast, there are standards, and we do try to you know look at the accuracy of what we're getting back from a response, right? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the comment I make is, Dave and you have probably done this now 15 years, maybe, I don't know how long, it's been a long time we've been doing stuff. Almost all, you know, not almost, any uh, well-qualified research firm basically builds slates of folks that participate, right? They have the right background. So it's not it's not like things get sent out randomly to anybody, you know, you, you sort of have to, you know, be, you know, qualified to be in the survey. And then you have to have qualified, qualified to sort of be answering questions for the survey, basically. So, you know, it's really, they're, you know, they're, they're all built on people that have insight into the area. Otherwise it wouldn't be particularly useful. And I would just say we've, you know, we're not an analyst firm. So what you're not getting from us is opinion. We really talk about the data. And so the data has got to be great. And as David knows, I mean, our firm has been around and we, of the largest, say, software tech companies, eight of them are clients. And mm-hmm. we have Series A, you know, non-public companies as clients. We are, if you search us, we are regularly cited. I mean, monthly in Forbes or CIO or the Wall Street Journal. So we carry big publications and they have called us and they have wanted to see the justification that the data is real. Um, not because they distrust us, it's part of their diligence before they start writing a story. And so we've we did that for years working with those major publications. And it's not an issue anymore because they know that we follow all the right methodologies and we can prove it at any point on any project. So, so I think that uh, going back to your original statistics you were talking about, 50 percent, we can believe in that 50 percent are well on their way in their cloud journey. And then I see that maybe 40 percent already have CCO, uh, CCOEs, right, Center of uh, Cloud Excellence or Operational Excellence centers. So uh, it's interesting that the industry is this far along and we believe that data. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, but that's a great segue because I was just going to go into that next area because we've kind of talked about adoption path and then sort of the app dev and some of the things related to that. 
Um, you know, and the other area we looked at was this whole area of operational governance, right? So um, maybe we can talk about some of the findings there, which Eric already cited one, which was, you know, organizations, you know, having set up that framework, right? You know, which is a, a cloud center of excellence. And, and there was a lot of other things, right? The, this is actually a little, this is also, again, I think validated by a lot of other research out there, which is, when you ask folks around where you think it sort of would just be nailed, right? This whole area of security and compliance and operational governance, but it's, it's sort of not, it's a mixed bag, right? It, it is a mixed bag. And I think, you know, as we looked into, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what people have today and kind of their maturity, then we'll drift into governance and, and, and that type of thing, you know, so on the good side, and I'm going to talk kind of operational because I want to sp split this out because there's an interesting point that we got from the interview. Seven out of 10 have visibility. Who's using what? Where is it? What cloud's it in? And what's it costing me? So they, they actually have gotten fairly mature than a few years ago with a bunch of developers spinning up instances that they're playing with that they never take down and nobody knows who it is and why this huge bills come in. So they've, they've certainly got some controls around that. And they've gotten the ability to actually think like, well, maybe we can reserve stuff and we know what a kind of bandwidth is for normal app or normal use and try to do some things that help reduce costs or give us better cost efficiencies. Um, we do see four, you know, and that was, you know, seven, seven out of 10 had visibility. 58% uh, had the ability to do cost and reservation kind of management side. 47% do right sizing, which we think of as scaling or dynamic scaling. So they've got the controls in there that allow their apps and their business to scale, to roll over into new, um, you know, spun up containers or VMs or what have you um, to, to help drive it. And, but I, I do want to point out one thing. So all those things sound fantastic and maturity, and they're operationally great. But one thing when we talked to the to almost every one of the people to interview, I asked them about kind of proactive cost management. Like, you know, what are you guys doing to really control costs and between this cloud and that cloud and not being surprised and knowing what this is going to scale? And it was kind of shocking because most of them said that they look at the bill when it comes and decide whether it seems unreasonable. And if they see something that's unreasonable, then they go figure it out. So while operationally they've gotten pretty mature and they're thinking about it, you know, going forward, they really haven't gotten a very proactive operational cost. You know, some of these people are still cutting a bill and dividing it out by cost centers and groups. And so there's a big opportunity for people to move that operational progressiveness into kind of a cost management um, and, and couple that with operations. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of cloud flexibility and that type of thing. But it does get to the other side that you're talking about the maturity, which is governance, right? And that is visibility and it's security and it's compliance. And what we do see is about 40% of the companies do have a center um, that's generally in, within the IT realm that is dedicated to cloud operation and hybrid cloud operation. Some actually use the COE term, uh, center of excellence. Some do not. It's just the cloud ops team or the cloud services team. And they have responsibilities for governance, compliance, and measurement, best practices. But earlier when, I was, when we were speaking with the follow-up question about DevOps groups, there are some companies that as not competitive, but as an extra layer, as we were talking about, sometimes that COE is running all the corporate apps, but sometimes that LOB has that, um, that DevOps team has that LOB app. And so they're running that app and they're looking to the COE for best practices and how to select a cloud and some of those things, but the operational responsibility is staying within that um, DevOps group. So that's always good for, for those of you that go out and you're talking to a customer trying to understand how they're operating, that you do see those models. One model, everything goes into the COE. One model, most goes into COE, like all your corporate apps, but they'll have a few uh, DevOps teams that are running around with, with control, but getting guidance um, from, from that standpoint. It's, it really is opportunity with all this going on to, to, to try to move to that holistic view that you want to see from governance, everything rolling in, having visibility, having control, and then if you could add in the proactive cost management, people would really be on the way. Yeah, you know, that, that's a great point that, uh, you know, a lot of people sort of have, have achieved that first or second rung on the ladder of maturity, but sort of the more advanced capabilities of proactive management, they're, they're just not there yet. 
Hey, um, just one last thing and sort of uh, move to wrapping up, but we also saw some interesting information on this notion of consolidation, right? You know, I think when everybody first went to the went to the cloud, it was effectively the wild, wild west, right? Which is like, you know, let everybody use whatever they want. You know, it's like team A is over on Azure and they're using whatever they want. Team B is over on, actually, it's even more complicated than that. Team A, B, C, D are all on Azure and they're all using different tools. <laughs> And then there's like five guys, five teams on AWS, and they're all using different tools. But we started to see some uh, interesting information, some interesting data points there. Maybe you can just highlight a, a few of what we're, what we're starting to see there. Yeah, no, I did want to pick up on what you were saying right there, David, which is it is still a little of the Wild West. I'd say you have, yeah. you know, some companies in the interviews, they develop on one platform and they deploy on another just because the developers like that platform. Mm -hmm. But it's not where the COE wants to run it. So we do still see a little of that. But I think what is really compelling is that when we looked at it, 95% of everybody that we surveyed, and this was correlated 100% with those we spoke with, are pointing their way towards consolidation and kind of unification. And it's across a lot of different vectors. And so let's talk where people, you know, kind of want to go. And it is they want to, you know, they want to leverage you know, a set of common paths or services across things. And that's roughly around 43%. They want to, you know, a, the common set of dev tools. I want to dev whether it's going on pr private cloud, public cloud A or public cloud B. I want to use the same dev tools all the time and get some consistency and economy of scales. And that's over half. That's about 52% of companies. That's a stated objective. Same thing with common infrastructure. We want to be able to you know, have a similar infrastructure that helps us become a term that I heard quite a bit in the interviews was cloud agnostic. And so they really want to be able to get infrastructure similarities that allow that to move to common tools, some cloud agnetism, which then moves to operational tools. If you want to become cloud agnostic, you've got to be able to develop and deploy, but you've also got to manage. And so that had the highest rating, again, of well over half that wanted to have some cloud agnostic tools. And the one insight that I would say from the interviews that is happening is your developers are driving a lot of this change, even subconsciously, because they've realized that, that they need, as an organization, to have a consistent set of tools. But it's also the adoption of containers. I talked to several people who said containers are the secret for us. If I can start developing on containers with a consistent set of tools, I can deploy anywhere. And if I can deploy anywhere with the same set of tools, they jokingly said these ops guys have to follow. And so they're gonna to have to get a common set of tools that can track it through the through the product life cycle. And so this is regardless of where they are today and, and they know that they're moving forward and they have some culture that we talked about and some preference to the developers like this or the ops team likes that, but they do know that for this, for their efficiency and their maturity to really deliver what the business wants, that agility, cost management, they have to get to a consolidated cloud kind of agnostic approach and that unlocks a lot of the freedoms and it is so we talked about before some of those past services they're really looking at them which ones are sticky and i can't transfer and which one of them can i call from the other cloud and so they are consciously thinking of that today which i would say three years ago was never even thought of so they're now aware of what's sticky on this platform and is it transferable and am i willing to live with that or am i going to you know obfuscate that or develop something in my app so i don't have to rely on something sticky so i can, can be cloud native so it is i think people are on the path the maturity there are different places but i think the consistency where they want to be is pretty compelling yeah it's yep. also inter interesting for me from my perspective of the human part of it as some of these engineers become architects right uh, the natural maturity of the people that are doing these application developments the kubernetes guys get up and they start getting promotion into leadership positions they quickly realize that well what i was doing in my own little stovepipe doesn't apply to these other places that now I'm starting to have to manage. And as soon as you hit that, you realize that governance and common tools across all of them help you be successful at these higher levels. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, why yeah. create a CICD platform different for, for everything, right? It should be the same thing. Right. Governance and quality. Sorry, David. Yeah. I, no, I was going to say, I just think we're sort of like moving into another phase of, of cloud and app debt, right? Where in the beginning, um, and it makes sense. It's, it's I would have done the same thing. It's that 
you want to give people a lot of freedom. You don't know the answer, right? And you don't know what's where value gets created. And so you give people a lot of freedom to do all kinds of things. And after a while, you realize that certain th- certain aspects of what you do are really cookie cutter and commoditized, and there's no reason to be different. You're not getting any value out of it. So you start to say, you know, we should just standardize in these areas because we don't care, right? It's, it's not important to what we do. And, uh, you know, being inefficient it also slows us down. You know, it's like, cause you know, every time you have to do a context switching between tool sets, right. Or, you know, between teams and there's no value in it. So you just start to standardize and, and eliminate the distraction. So you can focus on the things that matter. Absolutely. Hey, uh, this has been awesome, David. Hey, thanks for walking us through it. I, I, I do want to, you know, let a lot of our listeners know that uh, we're, in the process of creating, you know, an, uh, uh, a uh, ebook on this, you know, that sort of summarizes all of this. And so this is sort of an advanced look at some of those findings and that'll be out at some point and you'll find it on VMware somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where yet, <laughs> but uh, since it's not, it's not out yet, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll be putting a lot of this material out into the market so people can find it. Uh, Aaron, any last thoughts or David, any last thoughts? No, I, th- I think it's great to, you know, see some research because there's so much anecdotal conversation. Every organization you talk to has a different perspective. Some people, I, I go to, I went VMUGS in Toronto, ask how many people are doing this. And I got like of 300 people, seven people raise their hand and the other. So you just don't really know what, what, what's actually happening because different geos, different customer bases, people self-select when they come to VLOG meetings, right? And so they don't talk yeah. about it. So you get so much selection, it's hard to get. So it's great, it's hard to get the real answers. It's good to hear, David, uh, what uh, research is showing us because it gives us, now I hear that 50% number and I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty high. So thanks for putting that together. I know it's a lot of work to do studies and marketing and uh, I appreciate it. Yep. I was just gonna say, just on your point, Eric, because. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of market research because I really I, I see that problem all the time where people go, um, you know, I saw this or I saw that, you know, and you're like, well, that's great. You know, it's like a survey of one. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> you know? yep. And that becomes the whole point of view of something. Right. It's like I saw somebody do X, Y and Z, you know, like, yeah, that's awesome. But I have no no way of knowing if that's a, a larger trend or not. So I'm a big fan of uh, market research. David Gearinger, thanks a lot for being here. Dimensional Research, uh, thanks a lot for coming and spending some time with us. Absolutely, yep. my pleasure. It's good having you, David. It's good seeing you. Yeah, great to see you as well. All right, guys, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank-